World War, Vietnam, and Bosnia, weather has been either friend or enemy, never neutral. Meteorologists play a vital role in any military operation. The wrong forecast can send thousands of troops to their death. Men, machines, and military might will always be at the mercy of the weather. Weather forecasting is crucial for the most sophisticated fighting machine, the aircraft carrier. Modern technology hasn't isolated the military from the weather. Monitoring it has become more important. This is the USS George Washington. It's the largest and most advanced battleship in the world. The onboard weather station is equipped with the latest satellite and radar technology. This gigantic war machine is over 1,000 feet long and weighs 97,000 tons. It's heading off on a six-month tour of duty off the Bosnian coast as part of the NATO peacekeeping force. The crew of 6,000 must be ready for anything, and right now, all eyes are on the worsening weather. It's 6 a.m., the onboard weather office is completing a 24-hour forecast for the captain. What do you think about cloud ceiling? The ship meteorologists have got a nerve-wracking day ahead. Two exercises are scheduled. Both need constant weather updates. A frigate is due to come alongside in the next few hours to send over armament, a transfer that can only happen if the waves are less than 15 feet high. The ship's air wing is to begin their carrier qualification, a series of rigorous exercises that test if a pilot is ready for combat. The forecasters have to advise the captain if either of the exercises will be threatened by the weather. The forecast looks bad with high winds and rough seas. Up on the bridge, the chief meteorologist, Commander Bill Schultz, meets with commanding officer Captain Malcolm okay. Brandt. I'm ready. All on. This is uh, the uh, frontal system coming across the Appalachian. This is that uh, make conditions a little bit, a little bit too rough to get the uh, underwear replenished and done. Uh, the main center of the system is still tracking to the uh, north, to the east northeast. Uh, the gradient in front and the southerly is stiffening up considerably through the high pressure out here. How far south would we have to go to have a dramatic improvement? Down to about uh, about 33 north. Yeah, that's it. Looks like uh, Captain Branch decides that the seas are too rough for the frigate. He delays the armament transfer and orders the frigate to steam away and wait for calmer weather. George Washington Air Wing is made up of 80 planes. Everything from F-14 Tomcat to Hawkeye propeller planes. Before heading to Bosnia, the pilots must practice three maneuvers. First and most difficult, the planes land using their tail boats. Then they take off from the short runways using the catapult launch which shoots an aircraft from 0 to 165 miles per hour in two seconds. Finally, they must touch and go, a maneuver in which they hit the deck and then take off immediately. Today, 60-knot winds are a tough test for the pilot. on a 
jet which is steaming away from them at 30 knots. The waves make the carrier heave and pitch. If the pilot lands on the deck too hard as the carrier rises up, the impact could smash this plane's undercarriage. The pilots have to complete all three maneuvers both day and night. Only then will the George Washington be ready for action off the Bosnian coast. All navies and armies must be prepared to cope with any kind of weather. It's a lesson they have learned the hard way. In 1914, the First World War plunged the world into its first global conflict. A simple weather miscalculation led to the slaughter of the trench warfare. Weather forecasting was still a young science. 24-hour forecasts were only 50% accurate. Long-term predictions were useless, and the commanders had to rely on statistical records of previous summer. It was a fatal mistake. They had no idea so much rain could fall in the summer months. the British commander General Haig planned on overrunning the Germans at Eve in North Belgium. Although the campaign started in the height of summer at the end of July, the weather changed. It rained torrentially for two days before the attack began. What should have been firm, dry ground turned into thick, muddy clay. The rain poured down for weeks. The rainfall in August was double the recorded average. The ground turned into vast stretches of bog, a clinging, waterlogged mud that sucked artillery and heavy equipment down. The mud was so deep that men drowned in it. Artillery was useless. The rain-soaked ground cushioned the shells, and they fell harmlessly into the mud. For weeks, the British were trapped in their trenches, unable to advance more than half a mile. As winter approached, there was no hope of the water draining away. Soon, trench foot, pneumonia, and rats became rife throughout the trenches. Morale fell to an all-time low. But despite the weather, Haig blindly ordered his men to push on. After a massive push in November, the British troops overran the ruins of the town of Passchendaele. In three months, they'd advanced only a few miles from their starting point in East. 300,000 British and 200,000 Germans lost their lives. Bad weather had led to half a million deaths. later, torrential rain was still capable of stopping even the mightiest of armies. During the Vietnam War, each year between April and August, the summer monsoon would bring high heat and humidity with rain and thick clouds. And in the winter months, the weather showed little improvement. Drizzle and fog lasted for days or weeks on end. make matters worse, Vietnam is constantly battered by typhoons in the late summer and fall. Like their Atlantic counterpart, hurricanes, one typhoon can dump one and a half billion gallons of rain. In these conditions, fighting was virtually impossible. Rain and flooding made the few roads impassable, so air mobility was crucial. But the atrocious weather even grounded planes and helicopters.
monsoon rain clouds were so dense that radar signals were blanked out. Jet engines would frequently stall as they became waterlogged in the ferocious driving rain. The summer rains washed away runways. The weather had turned the conflict into a war of attrition, a drawn-out struggle in the mud and rain. Eventually, it became clear that a military victory was impossible. Continuation of the war became politically unacceptable. After nearly 10 years of conflict, the American troops were withdrawn. But there are rare occasions when technology has overcome the weather. In 1959, during the Cold War, an American nuclear submarine traveled under the northern polar ice cap and successfully burst up through the ice. It added a new dimension to the U.S. military machine. Ten times she is able to serve. Once at the North Pole, where crewmen performed a mission of sentiment, scattering the ashes of polar explorer Sir Hubert Wilkins. In 1931, he was the first to attempt a submarine cruise to the pole. Now, the skate's 12-day, 3,000-mile voyage under the ice, shown in Defense Department films, demonstrates that missile-carrying nuclear subs could lurk under the polar ice cap, safe from attack, to emerge at will and fire off H-bomb missiles to any target on Earth. A powerful retaliatory weapon for America's defense. Some types of weather have always been used to our advantage. Thick fog can hide the largest of armies. It gives an intelligent commander the element of surprise. In 1805, Napoleon was able to outwit a far bigger Austrian army by hiding the bulk of his troops in a foggy valley. Using a few of his men as bait outside the fog, he lured the Austrians down from the hilltop. Then, the rest of his troops burst out of the fog and annihilated the unsuspecting Austrian army. For centuries, many other armies have attempted to use fog to their advantage, though some with less success than Napoleon. Following the D-Day landings in 1944, the Allied advance into Western Europe had reached Belgium by mid-December. But their front had become severely stretched over a 600-mile line. They had no idea that two German panzer divisions were hidden in the fog-bound forests of southern Belgium. On December 16th, the German forces broke cover. They launched a two-pronged attack on the Allied line, hoping to cut off and crush the British and Canadian forces at the northern end of the Allied front. This counteroffensive took the Allies completely by surprise. The dense fog made air cover useless, and they could only rely on their ground troops. The Germans heavily outnumbered the Allies and soon drove a bulb-shaped wedge into the Allied lines in what would become known as the Battle of the Bulge. But on Christmas Eve, the fog suddenly lifted. Under clear skies, American and British planes obliterated the German offensive. By mid-January, the Germans had completely retreated. Wrecked and starved, they were the victims of the erratic behavior of the weather. With fog, they could launch an attack. Without it, they were fatally exposed. Violent weather can wreak much worse devastation. At sea, there are natural forces with more energy than all the world's nuclear weapons put together. Hurricanes and typhoons are the largest storms on Earth. Formed from the awesome power of the oceans, these monsters create winds up to 200 miles per hour. But forecasting when and where a storm will strike was a devastating advantage for the Japanese in 1941. On December 6th, a huge storm blew across the Pacific Ocean, northwest of Hawaii. 
the Japanese had accurately predicted the position of the storm and used it as cover to get that massive naval strike force close to the Hawaiian Islands. The next day, they launched an attack on Pearl Harbor. Bursting out of the cloud cover provided by the storm, their fighter planes took the Americans completely by surprise. The U.S. fleet was decimated. The Japanese sank eight battleships and two destroyers. Badly damaged nine other ships and destroyed 140 aircraft. The Japanese Navy had dealt a massive blow to the American fleet. Typhoon is risky. Weather can quickly change from ally to enemy. In the last year of the Second World War, the U.S. Third Pacific Fleet, commanded by Admiral Halsey, was desperately short of fuel. It had to rendezvous with tankers far out at sea off the Philippines. so big that only half of Halsey's ships managed to refuel. And when they discovered that a typhoon was headed towards them, they miscalculated its path and sailed straight into its center. The wind was so wild it was impossible to tell the sky from the sea. Huge waves up to 40 feet high scattered the fleet over 60 miles. The ships were pulverized. Planes broke their moorings on the carrier. 146 planes were lost. Three destroyers capsized. Seven other ships were seriously damaged, and almost 800 men lost their lives. The weather had caused one of the worst losses to the Pacific Fleet during the entire Second World War. In the 20th century, military forces took to the skies and weather forecasting became even more crucial. For the pilots of the Second World War, accurate predictions for cloud cover were essential. They needed perfect visibility before dropping the atomic bomb on Japan. The first bomb on Hiroshima was delayed for two days because of cloudy skies. Three days later, on August 9, 1945, the weather sealed Nagasaki State. The target for the second bomb had originally been the city of Kokura, but it was covered in haze. So the pilot, Major Charles Sweeney, flew on to Nagasaki, his secondary target, and dropped the second atomic bomb. Seventy thousand people were killed. Whatever atrocities are in the name of war, there's no doubt about the identity of the worst enemy. It is the cold. It can wreck the plans of the greatest army. In October 1939, at the outbreak of World War II, the Soviet Union invaded Finland. Stalin boasted that he would sweep through the country in two weeks. But his enemy wasn't just the Finns. It was also the intensely savage winter. Soon after the invasion started, winter arrived with a vengeance. The Soviets faced sub-zero temperatures without proper clothing or equipment. Frostbite attacked thousands of men. Artillery shells fell harmlessly into the deep snow. The tanks became trapped. Vehicle and gun lubricants froze solid. But the Finns were well prepared and they launched lightning assaults on the Russians. 
attacked on skis and wore white to camouflage themselves. Through three months of bitter weather, temperatures dropped to minus 50 degrees. The Russians lost over a quarter of a million men before finally overwhelming the Finns by sheer force of numbers. advanced technology and accurate forecasting, the military can still be thwarted by the weather. The NATO peacekeeping force in Bosnia knew that the winter might disrupt its mission, but the savage weather practically paralyzed it. were unable to land at airfields as fog reduced visibility to zero. The deployment of over 60,000 troops was delayed as severe snowstorms ravaged the area. Soldiers had to defend themselves against sub-zero temperatures. Ethnic cleansing continued as the NATO forces battled in vain to reach remote areas. The NATO commanders had no choice but to suspend operations until the weather improved. In war, we've managed to overcome some types of weather. But ultimately, it can never be tamed. More powerful than any weapon, more deadly than any army. Weather will always be the victim. In the age of dinosaurs, it was a dog-eat-dog -dog world, so to speak. How did the plant eaters keep from becoming a main course for hungry carnivores? Paleo World has the answer, next from TLC.